the questions to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development. And we will start with the listed questions. And I call Mr. Michael Copeland. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number one. Rivers Agency preparation for and response to the recent flood warnings in East Belfast was excellent. The agency organised and ran a real-time simulated emergency planning exercise focusing on coastal flooding in November 2013. This exercise involved 70 organisations, including all of the flood response agencies, the PSNI, Belfast City Council and other key stakeholders. And as a result, when the events of last week began to unfold, there was clarity on roles and responsibilities from the outset. And I should say excellent cooperation between all of the organisations that were involved. During this emergency response, Rivers Agency had a critical role in providing professional advice on the technical aspects of coastal flood risk. This included close liaison with the Coastal Monitoring and Forecasting Service and the Met Office throughout the holiday period to use the data that's available to forecast the level of flood risk, deciding on when to instigate an emergency response, identifying those areas of greatest risk, which included East Belfast, and informing an appropriate level of response. The input from the Rivers Agency in the coordinated multi-agency response led by the PSNI was critical in informing key decisions about vulnerable areas and infrastructure. The agency's timely engagement with the PSNI and other organisations, the technical support which it provided, facilitated the pre-deployment of resources and the strengthening of existing flood defences at Sydenham and elsewhere to successfully avert the threat of serious flooding. The agency was also directly involved in the provision and placing of sandbags in and around those areas that were under threat. Thank you, and I call Mr. Michael Copeland for a supplementary. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I do thank the Minister for her answer. And I would ask that, um, th that through her I could pass on my sincere thanks to those in River Agency for the actions that they, that they carried, um, carried out over that period of time. And it is true to say that we were, quote unquote, lucky as much as anything else. Um, given the fact that my understanding is water, when it's in Belfast Lock, is the responsibility of decal. When it enters the Conswater River, it's the responsibility of Rivers Agency. If it overflows onto the ground, it's the responsibility of DOE. And if it goes onto the roads, it's the responsibility of DRD. Could the Minister tell me, would she accept or could she explain um, why she continues to believe that um, Rivers Agency, for example, with all the responsibilities that it has, particularly at times of flooding, um, should continue within her own department? Would it not, or could she see Sorry. the logic of perhaps having it included in another department, perhaps the Department of Regional Development? I thank the member for his complimentary comments of River Agency staff, and I do um, obviously concur with that. Um, staff actually came in of their own veil off their leave um, to make sure that they were there to do all that they can, so thanks for that. But in terms of um, I mean, this incident in particular, obviously there was a multi annual or multi um, a multi-agency response to it because of the significant nature of what potentially could have happened. Um, Rivers Agency, as I said, very much were to the fore of technical advice and, um, keep it, and advising the, the entire group just of, of developments in terms of the weather and the potential that, that could have occurred. Um, in terms of the overarching, I mean, as I said, it was multi-agency approach, it was multi-agency um, involved because of the various responsibilities. And I think that this comes back to the, the point that was raised um, on the back of the PEGI report some time ago, where it was taking a look at what is the strategic role for, should there be one responsible um, department for the overarching flood and issues. So again, that's all in the mix, but it's something that needs to be considered further down the line in terms of um, the wider view of a review of departments and what responsibilities are within each department. And I call Mr. Robin Newton. Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, uh, can I thank uh, also the Minister for the response from the Rivers Agency in particular in the East Belfast situation where it was a river problem and where the, their, their, their role was in fact uh, crucial. There are a number of stakeholders in here and you've mentioned some of them, but primarily Minister, the stakeholders in this situation are the residents of Sydenham, the residents of Orangefield and the residents of, of, of uh, Clarawood. And can I say to you, Minister, there is a flood alleviation scheme in place, and I know you're aware of it, along the Conswater Greenway project. It is absolutely crucial that the investment that is there for it is implemented, that it's done as quickly as possible with the urgency and to produce the safety aspects that the, re the residents I've already mentioned along the route of that river, that they would enjoy at least some remit 
from the, the, the potential flooding for the future? Um, well, in terms of, of the wider project, I'm pleased that there has been progress to date, particularly in the Orangefield and Victoria Parks area. I mean, there's been, um, as I said, progress, the work is ongoing, and they're now almost complete in, in those two areas, in Orangefield and Victoria <coughs> Park. And, and obviously, we look forward to the construction starting in summer on the final phase of the Greenway project, and we're all very much committed to making sure that that happens within the time frame that we've set out. And um, we're looking at early 2016 for the whole project to be completed. The member will be aware there has been delays because of the failure of the tender um, when Belfast City Council between those and, and the company. So there's been delays, but I'm pleased with the progress to date and I'm pleased that we're on target to deliver the project, the full flood alleviation project in the whole area by the early 2016. Uh, for Colin, just two, uh, I suppose, indications to the questions should be short and to the point. Uh, this question relates very specifically to East Belfast, and anyone who wants in on a supplementary must address the question, otherwise they should indicate uh, if they want to withdraw. And I'm going to move on unless I get an indication. As well... <laughs> As well as East Belfast, is the Minister giving serious consideration to the allocation of more money uh, for capital schemes to deal with increasing difficulty of flooding in a number of locations across the north as well as the east of the city? Well, um, I'd be very foolish to stand as a minister and say that we wouldn't want more money. We always want more money. and we could. Um, I think in terms of the recent events, Rivers Agency um, will be doing a follow-up exercise in terms of looking at the resources that we have in place, what's in terms of inspections of areas that were impacted and then they'll be able to bring forward recommendations based on that on whether or not we need additional resources where we need to bring forward any additional work so that work will be, is ongoing and um, I think uh, as I said there, there will be options then coming forward from the residency if they feel they need additional resource to bring forward additional projects. Okay, I call Mr Oliver McMullen. Can the Minister tell us why did the PSNI lead on the preparation and response to the flooding as they are neither engineers nor experts in flooding? Um, well, flood risk in coastal areas has a significant um, risk to life associated with it, so it's classed as a Category 1 emergency. And in such situations, then, the lead in coordinating and directing um, preparations and response sits with the PSNI. The, I think it was very helpful the fact that we had the simulation exercise back in November, which meant that um, whenever we were faced with a situation such as, such as this, which could have been potentially a, a very, very dangerous situation, that um, the agencies were very clear on their roles and it was very clear from the start that given the rest of life, the PSNI needed to be in the lead. Okay, and uh, Mr. Sammy Wilson is not in this place, so I call Mr. Trevor Clark. Uh, question number three. To date, approximately 3,000 single farm payment claims remain to be finalised. My officials are working to finalise these claims as quickly as possible. In November 2013, I announced that 95% of claims, including the majority of businesses subject to inspection, will be finalised by the end of February 2014. 92% of single farm payment claims have been finalised since the 1st of December 2013. More farmers received their single farm payment in December 20, 2013 than ever before. And they call Trevor Clark for uh, Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for answer. Um, and I do welcome the fact that 92% are in receipt of their payment, Minister. But I'm sure you're like myself, coming from a rural constituency, I'm sure you'll be disappointed that your department actually haven't got that number much higher. Given the economic climate we're in, what's the, your department going to do to address those 3,000 farmers who are still waiting in receipt of their payment and to ensure those farmers are going to get that speedily? I can assure the member that it's my intention to get um, as many people paid as possible. As I said, we have made a great improvement in that. We had more farmers paid in December than in previous years. So there is progress, but we obviously have, have more to do to, to be able to get us to a position where we were able to pay everybody as early as possible. So um, for, for those people that are remaining the outstanding claims, there's a variety of reasons as to why some people aren't paid. It could be around probate. It could be around um, people not providing bank details. It's hard to believe, but in this day and age, some people still won't provide bank details. Um, there's, there's, as I said, a varying degree of, of reasons as to why those people um, haven't been paid, but we're working our way through it. And I intend to meet the target that I've set out for February 2014 also. 
you and Mr. Declan McAleer for supplementary. Very well, good. Ken Corlea. Uh, could the minister tell us, um, is it possible to review, uh, to speed up the, 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 the process whereby uh, decisions are reviewed? Yes, the, the single farm payment review and decisions procedure is a two-stage process. Um, stage one involves a review by, of the decision by an officer within the department who has not previously been involved in the case, while stage two involves a review by an external panel. The panel considered the department's decision against the EU regulations and agreed policy and make a recommendation. The panel's recommendation is not binding on the department. The final decision rests with the head of the pen agency of the department and then the stat department's statutory responsibility can't be delegated to the panel. So we're working to reduce the backlog of cases at both stage one and stage two and to reduce the time that's taken to process some of these cases. We met our target and over 400 stage one cases and 80 stage two cases were finalized by the end of 2013. The current backlog at stage one has reduced to 132 cases. However, the clearing of stage one cases has had a knock-on effect at stage two and 101 cases are now sitting at various stages within the process. Of these, work on 62 cases has not yet started. In June 2013, um, two additional case officers were seconded to the Stage 1 team to assist with clearing the backlog of reviews. Since then, we've been able to halve the number of outstanding cases and are continuing to bear down on this. Additional resources have been made available within the Stage 2 process. However, because of the level of knowledge required to deal with the comp complex issues and the period of time necessary to be, um, become com uh, competent in this work, the benefits of increased resources is now only becoming fully realised. The workload and resourcing um, levels of the team is also being continually monitored to make sure that we can speed everything up and get um, as many cases dealt with as quickly as possible. Thank you. Mr Tom Elliott. Uh, thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for that update. Uh, there appears to have been remote inspection system introduced this year where, where two areas uh, were inspected, and I think the Ban Valley and, and Clahar Valley were the two areas. Uh, there appears to be no payments made to any of the people involved in those. Can the Minister explain why? Yes, the, the Member will be aware that we're in the process of trying to speed up payments, and part of that is actually being able to ramp up the number of inspections that we do um, by remote sensing. The two geographic regions selected for the 2013 um, scheme were um, they encompassed the towns of Portland, Own, Mahara, Maharfalt, Garva in the east, and Five Mile Town, Ahar, Clahar, Tempo, um, and Fintna in the west. So the majority of those inspected cases will all be paid by the end of February 2014, and I can give the member an assurance, um, and that's actually earlier than, than would have been the situation last year. So we're working our way through um, all of those cases, um, being able to speed up the number of people um, who are uh, inspected by remote sensing is key for us to be able to move forward and improve the payment rate as early as possible in December. Thank you, and I call Mr. Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I don't come from a, a farming background, but I do come from a self-employed background. Uh, and one of the worst aspects uh, that any self-employed person has to suffer is delays in payments uh, from public authorities. And uh, this is one such. And I'm saying to the minister, I'd ask the minister to radically uh, uh, look at the system of review so that uh, this endless uh, 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 delay in uh, payments is eradicated or kept to a basic minimum. 8% is still high and it should not be repeated. I um, am very aware of how important a single farm payment is to um, individual farmers and those that haven't received their payment are obviously anxious, which is natural and totally acceptable. Um, in terms of the targets that we set, we have improved things. Things have got, we are in a better position. There's a better picture. However, my aim is to make sure that we deal with those remaining um, cases as quickly as possible. And as I said, by February 2014, we have a, a target of 95 per cent, and that's what we're, we're in line to, to achieve that. We have done better than the targets that we'd set out. However, I want to be in a position where we pay all farmers um, their maximum amount of money in as quick a time frame as possible, and we have made massive improvements to be able to do that, and we'll continue to drive forward that agenda for change. And particularly, and I alluded earlier in the, in the answer to Declan McLear in terms of the review process, we also want to be able to get that sorted out as quickly as possible also. Thank you, and I call Ms Anna Lowe. Question done for four, please. I'm scheduled to meet the Minister of Environment tomorrow to discuss the next Rural Development Programme, including agri-environment schemes. 
my officials have already been working closely with officials in the Department of the Environment on the design of the Agri-Environment Scheme for the next Rural Development Programme. It is proposed that land designated under the EU Habitats and Birds Directive will be a priority for entry into the new scheme. This will support, uh, will support specific uh, management plans for designated sites to help meet obligations under the Habitats and Birds Directives. The existing Agri-Environment Scheme under the current Rural Development Programme has been prioritised towards designated sites. At the 30th of November 2013, over 25,000 hectares of designated land was being managed under Agri-Environment Scheme agreements. The budget available for the new Agri-Environment Scheme has yet to be finalised, however the, production, or the protection of designated land will be one of the priorities in the next scheme and funding will be targeted to achieve the best effect. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I want to thank the Minister for her reply. Um, given the uh, zero rate transfer from Pillar 1 to Pillar 2, and obviously with the much reduced uh, funding uh, for Pillar 2 and for the, therefore for the ACRI environment schemes, can I ask the Minister if we are at risk now or in the near future uh, of infection fines from the EU in, in kind of missing the targets? Um, I'm keen to assure the member that I am as committed to environmental schemes going forward in the new programme. We now, because of the, of the court ruling and the decision by um, DEFRA to go forward to Europe with a 0% transfer, um, we have a reduced budget. And that's going to have an impact on the environmental side of things, the rural dwellers, and also on farmers, because the money that I would have transferred over was to help get a balanced approach to supporting all of those different um, elements to the rural communities. And I think you have to take a very holistic view of the, of the entire rural community. But I want to assure the member that I was committed to taking forward the schemes. There will be farmers out there who will be anxious about the schemes for um, looking to the future. And I want to, um, as I said, give that assurance that I am um, going to bring forward schemes. We will give that commitment to farmers. And as I said, we're, at official level, they're already very much um, focused on making sure that the, the new scheme, that we're talking to DOE officials, that we're designing the new scheme to best meet the needs of the environment and obviously meet our, our requirements under the Birds and Habitats Directive. Thank you. I call Mr. Joe Byrne. Principal Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for her answer. Can the Minister tell the House what level of formal or informal discussions did she have with ministerial colleagues before her announcement on December 20, and in particular with the Minister for Finance? Well, I'm very happy to um, provide the House. I mean, I just I started to deliver a statement just before um, question time, and we'll come back to that. Um, there was, as part of the normal process of executive business, um, I wrote to all departments, all ministers, seeking their views on the very issue of my pillar um, transfer and the potential for transfer. The DFP minister made no response to that on both occasions. But yet then, further down the line, sought, um, thought it um, appropriate to take a court case without going through the executive and the normal procedure. So um, that's, that's the correspondence that I had with ministers um, prior to taking the decision. I call Mr Gregory Campbell. Uh, the, the minister has been alluding to the processes regarding her discussions with the finance minister. On the wider context, uh, does the minister realise and now accept the substantial difference that has occurred between before 2007 and since 2007, that issues like this do need to be brought before the executive for approval rather than simply proceeding uh, on a, a standalone basis? Oh, I, I, um, in, in, over the past number of years, I've been very much committed to taking forward the CAP discussions. I've been out of Europe um, on a very regular basis debating the issues, fighting the corner for our local farmers. I took this decision on the basis that this is the core business of my department. I didn't see any reason to bring this decision to the executive. The core remit of my department is very much to improve the social and economic um, infrastructure of rural communities. And this, to me, was a decision that was taken based on a very balanced approach on the back of a consultation on engaging with stakeholders that looked towards the needs of farmers, of the environment, and of rural dwellers and rural businesses. So for me, the 7% transfer rate was something that was a very logical, fair, and balanced approach to take forward. The court, obviously, when the case the DFP minister, as I said, had no issue with the transfer rate when he was um, written to and made no response to that, but yet and all failed to have an executive discussion but wanted to go to court. So maybe we need to question about what's the motivation behind that decision and is it a politically motivated decision? And I call Mr Loris Kelly. 
Uh, question five, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. As I have advised in the statement I made today, a uh, 0% rate of transfer for the North of Ireland from Pillar 1 to Pillar 2 has been notified to the European Commission for de by DEFRA for the scheme years 2014 to 2019. This means that there will be no transfer of monies to rural development at this time. It is critical that we review this decision at the first opportunity, which will need to be done by 1 August 2017, as permitted by the European regulations. The regulations allow for the transfer rates for scheme years 2018 and 2019 to be increased, which would bring additional investment into the programme in those years. In view of the Minister's earlier comments uh, and the very uh, public political slapping about which uh, the DUP Finance Minister seemed to employ against her and her department, has the Minister any comment to make on the failure of political leadership, uh, which was uh, words I believe used in the judgment as a result of the case taken by her ministerial colleague? Well, I mean, I think it's unfortunate to say the least that the DFP minister saw fit to, to go to the courts as opposed to coming to the executive to have a very reasoned and, uh, and logical discussion. Um, and again, I would question the motives as to why, why, why that would happen. Um, I'm not going to be sidetracked. However, this decision is now taken. We're sitting with a, um, we have no transfer rate. We have an opportunity to review that in 2017, and obviously we look towards that. But we have to be serious about looking at and supporting rural communities in the whole. So that's, I think some people are attempting to portray this as it's farmers versus the environment, where the farmers are the natural custodian of the countryside and very mindful and very obviously dependent on the environment around them. So it's very much not about that. It's about a balanced approach. As I said, I'm not going to be um, distracted. I, I'll get on. There's a number of big decisions to be taken, and I'll take those in the time ahead. And I'll take them based on corresponding with stakeholders. We've had over 400 responses to the consultation. And we have an ongoing consultation um, now at this pre present moment in time that runs up until January 17th. So any decisions I take will be for the best interests of a fair and balanced rural economy, looking after the needs of farmers, environment and the rural, the rural dwellers and rural businesses. And that's the only thing that you can be guided by whenever you're taking a decision, because this is something that's so majorly important to rural dwellers and to, to farmers. This is something that's going to be in place and run right up into 2020. So we need to get it right. So I, I will carry on with, with my business and I believe this is my core business. Thank you. And I call Mr Cahill Boylan. I last time earlier, but could I ask the Minister, does she think that the Executive needs to provide funding for going for growth? Yes, because obviously the eventual um, the shape and the size of the programme is going to depend on the resources that are available to it. And given the fact now that we've been forced into a position where we're unable to transfer funds over to support the agri-food industry, and that's very much what this was about, this 7% transfer would allow for support for schemes like capital grant schemes, for sheds, for fencing. And these are the things that farmers are asking for. Very much whenever I'm out and about, that's, that's one of the things that we need to, that farmers are asking for us to be brought forward. So the executive are now going to have to um, step up to the mark to support rural communities, to support the agri-food industry. And you have to remember, throughout all um, the last number of years of recession, economic decline, agri-food has continued to do well. It's been, we've worked very hard to bring it to the forefront and be centre stage in terms of economic recovery. So the executive now has to support. What we have now is a vision in the Going for Growth document, and what the executive needs to do now is support that in going forward. And whenever I go to the executive over the next number of weeks with the Going for Growth strategy, I expect to get that support. Thank you. And I call Ms Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister so far for her answers? And would the Minister agree with me that the Executive and not the High Court is surely the best forum to debate and decide decisions such as this? And does she feel that this puts at risk future funding for farm safety? Such a vital issue which our Agricultural Committee will be focused on, focusing on yet again tomorrow. Yes, it certainly makes things more challenging. And if you look towards them, even the current programme, the types of things that the modulated money has been, um, has been paying for, and they've all been farm-related or farm-family related, particularly around training, around BVD training, around um, focused farms, family mentoring support. So all the range of measures that, um, that have, are in the current programme and are funded through modulated money, there's obviously danger now in, in moving forward on what we can afford to do. So, I agree with you totally that this is a discussion that should have been held in the executive, not through the courts. That being said, we are where we are and we have to deal with it. But I, as I said, won't be sidetracked. I'll be having to take a number of key decisions in the time ahead um, based on the needs of stakeholders and the entire rural communities. And, and that's something, as I said, as the consultation cl comes to a close um, and it's on the 17th of January, then we'll have to take decisions on the, on the way forward that best meet the needs of rural communities. 
McGowan. I call Mr Paul Frew. Uh, Speaker, would the Minister agree with me that the best way and the most direct way to get financial assistance to the farming community was through single farm payments? And would the Minister agree that it was left to the DUP to fight for that payment and to restore that payment to the farming community? No, would be the simple answer. And, um, the decision, as I said, the DUP might want to just look after one section of a rural community. I very much want to look after everybody in the rural community. And you have to take a balanced approach. So you shouldn't play one off against the other. You need to support the farming community. You need to support rural dwellers and rural businesses. And the Rural Development Programme is a fantastic vehicle to be able to do that. So the DUP might want to just look after one section of the rural community. I look after it in its entirety. Thank you. And I call Mr Sidney Anderson. Thank you. Question six, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, my department has now issued 32 letters of offer worth over £17.5 million to strategic projects across, seven, across all of the seven um, cluster areas. These projects are already contributing to spend with £4.7 million claims paid to date and a further £3 million to be claimed this financial year. Indeed, several of the projects are now complete and bringing in much needed income to rural areas. When I, announced, um, when I originally announced the refocus of Access 3, it was to increase investment in rural areas at a time when the economy was in decline and to ensure that no funds were returned to Europe. I'm pleased to say that my actions have been effective and in December we saw our highest value of quarterly claims processed so far at 3.5 million, bringing our total spend to date to just over 58 million. We now have over 1,800 projects on the ground and despite the difficult economic climate, the programme has created over 450 rural jobs to date with more to come. Rural tourism projects, um, projects funded by Access 3 have accounted for 121,000 visitors, and this will rise again as more projects come on stream. An additional 14,500 rural businesses and rural dwellers now have broadband thanks to the DART investment in the Next Generation Broadband Project, and over 300 community and social economy projects have benefited from the Access 3 funding. So I am happy to report that the Access 3 is making a real difference to rural dwellers and to communities and is helping to sustain and grow rural businesses which form an important part of our rural economy. I call Mr Sidney Anderson for a supplement. Uh, thank you and I thank the Minister for that detailed response. However, Minister, in the wider context of the reform for, uh, on the common agricultural policy, can you, can you outline what steps uh, you intend to take to support young entrants into farming? Yeah, I think that's actually um, it's vital in moving forward, and it's one of the decisions that we'll have to take on, as a result of the consultation on cap reform and moving forward. Um, if you look at the age profile of farmers, it's very important that we attract and, and help um, young people to stay in the industry. So looking at a scheme um, that, that will support new entrants or, or young farmers and or young farmers um, is going to be vital. But as I said, it's one of the things that we're consulting on at the minute, and we'll take decisions on that in the very near future. Thank you. And I call Ms Sandra Overland. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister explain to the House why priorities were not agreed beforehand, something which, uh, something which would have avoided the High Court force uh, over Christmas? Well, um, I was in the High Court over Christmas because of a DFP um, Finance Minister's uh, disagreement with my decision. Um, whenever the court uh, made their ruling, I brought a paper to the executive and it wasn't agreed. So um, I took the decisions, um, as I said, based because I believe this is my core business to take these decisions. Um, in the past, in terms of modulation and decide, decide not to move money, I've been able to take those decisions without um, any challenge. So it's strange that the DFP um, minister uh, decided to take this challenge at this particular time, but only he can answer for, for why that was. Call Mr. Mickey Brady. Before I got the pre last one, call you. Uh, my question to the Minister was Does she think that the strategic projects have had the impact you hoped for? And I think you did answer it to some degree in your first answer. Before I got Yes, and I, th I think that um, I did, as I said, I outlined um, some of the, the fantastic I think, elements to, to the, the projects going forward. They've made uh, fantastic benefits to rural communities. Increased spend at a time of um, recession is obviously something that, that's um, very much to be welcomed, so I think that it has been very su successful over the last year, year and a half. And uh, Mr Dominic Bradley is not in this place, so I will call Mr Sean Lynch. And Mr Sean Lynch is not in this place. Oh, he is. Where is he? Oh, there he is. Sean Lynch for topical questions. Available. 
Okay. Um, can I ask the Minister to outline the potential for tourism on the Forest Estate? Um, yes, the Forest Service already delivers significant um, recreational and tourism benefits, and the potential exists for further development, particularly through working with other rec um, recreational and tourism providers. Forest Service is continuing its work in development partnership arrangements with local authorities and other recreational providers to ensure that opportunities for progress are fully realised. This approach has led to the development of improved facilities in many areas, including um, major mountain bike projects completed in Castlewell and Forest Park, Ross Trevor Park and Dava Forest in partnership with um, the local councils. We've seen multi-purpose trails network completed in Castle Ward, a regional play park opened in Sleeve Gullion, biodiversity trails, um, trails launched in Learmount Forest in partnership with Derry Council. So there's been a whole suite of um, partnership um, working which has really been to the benefit um, in terms of tourism in our, in our forests. And the Forest Service is also using funding from the Executive's Economy and Jobs Initiative to improve recreation and tourist facilities within Forest Service properties under the theme of supporting um, infrastructural investment. Dr Lynch for supplementary. Um, as the Minister is aware, there is a, a tree disease, and does she believe that this will impact on this tourism potential? Um, obviously, we would want to limit any impact that tree disease will have on, on the potential of, of our forest. So, um, my department continues to put significant resources into tackling um, this disease, particularly, um, I think the member is referring to P. Ramorum. We've had follow-up inspections on sites identified through aerial, um, aerial surveillance in June and September and have confirmed an increased area of infected larch and, as compared to 2012 and outbreaks in new geographic areas, notably westwards as far as um, County Fermanagh. So felling is underway at 12 force, um, including an area of 164 hectares, and further action will be taken forward on a prioritised basis. We continue to engage with AFBI on research to help our understanding of the disease and we're working closely with plant health colleagues in the south and across in Britain. Since the disease was first um, diagnosed in Larch in 2010, over 900 hectares of Larch plantation have been failed to control the disease. So obviously these things do have an impact in terms of access to our forests, and we very much seek the cooperation of landowners and those people, general public, that visit our forests in terms of um, observing the biosecurity features and, and taking um, uh, I suppose precautions in, in, in washing wheels, for example, on bikes and prams when using our force. So we want to be able to limit the damage that disease can do um, to the tourism potential of our force. Mr. Stuart Dixon. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Thank you, Minister. Minister, last year uh, you will remember that my constituency of East Antrim had, uh, was affected by some of the worst of the winter conditions, uh, particularly the uh, snow. Um, and to that end, um, particularly rural um, and very isolated farms in the glens of Antrim suffered the most. Can the Minister tell us what lessons her departmental officials have learned and what uh, provision she has in place should we have similar conditions this year? Yes, and obviously the, the, the scenes that we witnessed last year were shocking. I mean, the extreme weather was um, something that hadn't been seen in, in quite a number of years. Um, I, I think that going into, um, we obviously on the back of that, we set up the fodder task force, which was looking at sort of prepared, preparedness for winter. And we're continuing to do that. And we've had a number of farmers actually that have taken part in our CAFRI courses around feed management. So that's, um, I suppose, in preparation for if this potentially um, occurred again. We worked with um, all the different stakeholders, so with the farming unions, with the banks, with the feed providers, to make sure that um, we were put in place everything that could be put in place in the event of something like this happening again. The task force met on numerous occasions and they have agreed to meet again as and when required um, if, if we were to find ourselves in that position again. So I believe we're in a better state of preparedness. I um, believe that. Um, there were lessons obviously learned from all agencies because it was again it was a multi-agency re um, response to to that snow. So hopefully we don't find ourselves in that position again. But if we do, I believe that we're in a better state of preparedness. Dixon for a supplement, and I'd like to thank the minister for her her assessment thus far. 
Minister, the recent experience of the flooding, particularly in places like Carnlock, Carrick, Fergus and further up the coast, should have demonstrated to us the value of one lead agency. That clearly is the PSNI. Does she agree with me that it would be appropriate that should we have further severe winter conditions, the PSNI should be the lead agency coordinating district councils and others? I think it would be dependent on the circumstances of the incident at the time. Um, in this, because of the flooding, because of the risk to life, it was decided that the PSNI was the natural lead. If that was the case that w in the future, if that was what was needed, then I'd be open to um, whatever, whatever, doing whatever was best for the situation at that time. Thank you. And Commissioner Trevor Clark. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister will be aware, maybe last week in the news, we seen where my constituency colleague highlighted the rural crime problem we have, and it's not something that's new. Could the Minister tell us maybe what she's doing in conjunction with the PSNI and her department to try and tackle this problem that has been going on for some time now? I agree with you, and it is a serious problem. And I've had ongoing engagement with um, DOJ and with the Chief Constable. Um, we actually meet on a regular basis just to discuss issues and emerging trends and themes that, um, that everybody's picking up on. Um, we have a very eff efficient um, enforcement team in place, um, and we also have a representative now on the Rural Steering Group. So that's all the agencies working together around um, the best approach. So I'll continue to carry um, forward my role in terms of. Um, addressing what are the very real concerns of rural dwellers around crime. Um, and you'll be aware in, in particular areas we have issues with cattle theft, in other areas it could be around equipment. So we need to look at everything and make sure that um, all agencies are playing their role. And I'll not be shy in always taking my issues to the PSNA and also the DOJ. I have a clerk for a supplementary. <laughs> yeah. so, so, sorry about that. I was actually daydreaming there after that. Uh, um, in, in terms of that, I mean, can the Minister maybe outline exactly what her department has been doing to date? Because I'm sure you will accept that uh, I think statistically the, the, the figures are an increase. So why do I accept what the Minister said that there has been various agency meetings and agencies are working together? But would you accept not enough has been done? Could you give us an insight what you're going to do and what has been happening? Well, I think that it's a positive that we now have a rural crime steering group. So I think that's good that we have all the agencies sitting around the table and working together around how we can combat um, rural crime. I mean, the member is aware that um, responsibility for combating rural crime falls primarily to the Department of Justice and, and to PS, PSNI. But DARD um, have continued to play their role, particularly around um, our CAFRI advisors, you know, giving advice around um, keeping your equipment safe, keeping your, your, uh, all, your owners, all your individual things safe. And we have been working in terms of um, workshops, providing, you know, at the colleges having workshops around rural crime around rural crime awareness. So there's quite a number of things that are being taken forward in conjunction with, um, with the other agencies. And I think, you know, in looking to the future and looking towards um, support for, for example, um, farm modernization program, I think as a criteria, we may want to consider things like you have to have identification tags on your things. So I think there's a number of initiatives that we can take forward that will be hopefully of benefit to, to rural people. Mr. David McNary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I ask the Minister, would she join with me in recommending to our young farmers that they would follow the example of the future King, Prince William, by enhancing their agricultural qualifications? Well, I think it's encouraged in, itse in itself that our agricultural colleges are oversubscribed. So we already have a so of the young people that are see, see a future in either farming or food. So that's something that's very enc encouraging. We have an opportunity now with cap reform to actually tailor supports, financial supports for young farmers. So obviously that's um, something that hopefully will create a bit of an incentive to support those young people to stay in the industry. As I said earlier, the age profile of the farming community is, is something that's of concern. We need to sustain that for the future and the only way we can do that is if we have new people and young people coming into the industry. So whatever I can do to su um, support those young people to, to come into the industry, to encourage them, and we're doing that through, as I said, through our colleges and hopefully then through cap reform with some financial incentive also. Mr McNary for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, and I wonder, um, can I take it in what she's saying, uh, as she's already identified the potential of difficulties with the new cap schemes um, for, in particular, young farmers? Um, is she able to perhaps say or give some kind of direction to these young farmers at, as to what level of qualifications they should be pursuing that will help them in their, in, in their future? 
Well, I think, as I said, it's part of the consultation process, and we can look at all of that, um, and I haven't taken final decisions on it. But obviously, in looking towards um, new ways of farming, being innovative, young people um, having the qualifications is obviously something that's significant and will assist them in terms of their own business and how they run their business. So um, we very much encourage people to get on board to attend the courses. Um, and we have formal and sort of less formal um, learning environments for people, so it tries to appeal to everybody. Well, Mr. Michelle Michael Vin. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what plan she has to convene a meeting with relevant stakeholders to explore options around the restructuring of the fishing fleet, um, in particular around the issue of decommissioning? Uh, I think it was back in November time I met um, with the representatives of the fishing industry and I suggested at that time that I thought it would be important that we could get a stakeholder forum back together again. It's something that happened in the past, so I think there are benefits all around if that was to happen. So I agreed to meet um, for officials to meet with the industry again this month, and then we'll take it forward straight after that. Michael Bean for supplementary. Thank you. And further to that question, can the minister confirm if monies which had been ring fenced under EFF for decommissioning are still available? I will, um, I will write to the member on that issue, but in terms of moving forward, obviously we have the new EFF and we have the EMFF, so um, there are opportunities there for funding for the industry. But I think if we were to get that stakeholder group again together, let's get a collective voice about what are the needs of the industry and then use the European funding to obviously to, to meet the, the needs that are identified. And, uh, Ms. Judith Cochrane is not in a place, so I'll call Mr. Ian McRae. Um, can the, the Minister um, detail how many farms had their remote sensor um, inspection carried out in 2013? I don't have the figures on me, but somewhere around 1,200, but I'll, I'll confirm in writing to, to the member. And there were two areas that were chosen, two geographical areas, one towards the east and one towards the west. So I think it's around about 1,200, but I'm happy to confirm in writing. We pray for supplementary. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, can the Minister uh, advise the House why um, these farms or farmers weren't notified that these inspections were taking place? Um, because many of them were expecting money at the end of the year and found that that, that didn't happen. And the Minister will certainly be aware that uh, farmers depend on that money. So, can she detail why they weren't informed that these inspections were taking place? Well, we did actually write to, to people who were being inspected. Obviously, the aim is to get as many inspections done by remote sensing as possible, so we're in a position to get payments out quicker. Um, I suppose that's challenging to start, and it's different for people and uh, all the rest. But by the end of February, we intend to have those people who were um, inspected that way to have their payments with them. So we're working, we're working actively towards that now at this moment in time. Um, but people were written to individually to say that their, their inspection was um, being taken. That way. Well, Mr. Declan, Michael Lear. Um, Grima Agat, uh, last can call you. Uh, given that there may well be uh, environmental implications of the DAP inspired court case to quite a transfer of funds from Pillar 1 to the Rural Development Programme, could the Minister tell us what was the response of the Environment Minister when you alerted him of your proposal to transfer 7% from Pillar 1 to Pillar 2? Yes. As I said earlier, when I uh, wrote to all ministers, the DOE minister was the only minister that actually responded to the potential um, Pillar 1 to Pillar 2 transfer. Obviously, he's very concerned about the environmental schemes and wants to see them going forward. He's also very alert to the fact that our officials have been working together to try and design the new scheme and have it in place and ready to go as soon as uh, we implement the new cap. So that was his concerns, and he wanted to just make sure that we were protecting the environment. I want to, as I said earlier, assure the member that I am as wedded to ensuring that we bring forward um, environmental schemes, albeit it's going to be more difficult now because we have a lesser pot of money. For a supplementary. Last call, the Minister has already answered by supplementary. 